Bob, I, I, as I said, I just finished reading uh, the book and I'd like to welcome you. Uh, you're a new member of Blue and Gray the last few months. And, and lo and behold, did I not know what I was getting when I, when I got a new member? What a, what a treat. Uh, uh, the book was a fascinating read. And what I'd like to know uh, to start off is how'd you end up writing about uh, such an interesting subject? Well, again, thanks for inviting me. Um, it, it, you came at just the right time because if you'd asked me a week later, next month is Women's History Month and I'm pretty much, you know, booked, but this worked out just great. So I'm glad to be here this evening. How did I come to write this book? Um, I had written a book before this. I was in the corporate world for a number of years. And when I retired, I had a passel of letters that I had inherited from a soldier of the 155th Pennsylvania. So I went out and I started, um, after I transcribed them, I went out and started to research them. And I kept coming across the names of these five women who eventually became the better angels of my book. Um, <clears throat> I went to the archives, the National Archives, uh, spent time there, went to all of the battlefields where this uh, soldier fought uh, with the um, Army of the Potomac and spent a lot of time reading, a lot of reading. And I kept coming across these names of women. And I kind of zeroed in on the five names of the, of the women who are in the book. And the reason I selected these women is I believe that they had a major impact on the American Civil War that came along in a timeline uh, where their needs, where their work was most appreciated and most needed. Uh, and the other thing was all of them had incredible legacies to this day, um, with maybe one exception, which may change. Um, four of the five women uh, are well known today. I'm not sure they're well known for the things that I appreciated in writing about them, but they are pretty well known. And the things that they did are almost signature things in American history. So uh, people have asked me, well, why didn't you choose some other women that were probably, you know, is equally involved in the war. I was looking for women who were accomplished, not to, to say that women who had written great uh, things, uh, letters, or kept diaries, as many women did, uh, weren't important, but these women accomplished things. I use that word very deliberately. And they've just stayed for 150 years. Um, in our, in our minds, not always the way I would want us to remember them, but we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. <clears throat> so there were no, you know, some who were considered but didn't make the cut. Um, these five just resonated with me. And, and the more I dug in, the more research I did, the more they made sense to, to choose those five. And I guess if now is the appropriate point, I, I can talk about the five women and why I selected them. Uh, and this is chronological, um, not alphabetical. Harriet Tubman was a woman who freed herself in 1849 from Dorchester County, Maryland. Uh, she started out with her two brothers and they got cold feet. They thought that the consequences of being caught uh, as enslaved people far outweighed the, the promise of freedom. So very soon in the process, she, they decided to bail out, but she continued and she continued across three straight, three states, Maryland, uh, Delaware, and then eventually into Pennsylvania uh, and was successful and say, great, you know, uh, most of us would say, well, that's one and I'm done. But Harriet Tubman went back 14 times, return trips to Dorchester County to free people. Uh, and if that doesn't sound like compelling enough, just remember that the Fugitive Slave Act had been passed in 1850. That made it a crime, even in the North, to aid and abet escaped slaves. You could go to jail for that. Um, but Harriet went back and freed more people. We think somewhere in the vicinity of about 80 people were freed by her during that period of time. And of course, every time she went back and accessed her Underground Railroad, as it became known, the stakes got higher and higher because safe houses were compromised. People talked. Uh, it was harder and harder to keep the Underground Railroad um, secret during that period of time. Uh, there were slave catchers out there who got paid handsomely for bringing back escaped slaves. So there was a monetary reason. <clears throat> 
And there was the fear of, uh, of being arrested in the North of hate, helping slaves escape. So I, I just thought, this was a woman who, who resonated with me, sheer bravery, sheer absolute bravery. The second woman that I talk about is Harriet Beecher Stowe. <clears throat> and she wrote this incredible novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which really moved at least the North towards uh, the Civil War. In fact, it was Lincoln who he met her in the White House in the early 1860s said to her, quote, so you're the little woman who started this war end of quote, um, that may be you know, arguable, but um, she felt very strong and she produced uh, this incredible novel, which I call a novel of social justice. Um, others have followed in those footsteps. If you think of the book um, by Upton Sinclair called The Jungle about the meatpacking industry, sure. so using fiction to tell a story and get people you know, concerned and, and wanting to do something. And certainly John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, another fictional account, brilliantly written and very compelling story about the, the problems of people in Dust Bowl America. So uh, not only did she write this incredible novel, which sold, uh, the first year it was out, sold 300,000 copies. Well, I could tell you there are authors who would give their right arm to sell 300 copy, 300,000 copies of a book. And she did that and it went on to, to sell millions uh, over the course of time and translated in at least 15 to 20 languages. The next person I talk about is Julia Ward Howe. Um, and she wrote this incredible hymn, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And we'll maybe talk a little bit more in detail about how she happened to do that. But she came to Washington with her husband in 1861. And quite frankly, the union at that point was in complete disarray. It had been a... Um, a revolving door of generals. Uh, the two battles of Manassas had been fought and lost by the Union. Uh, George McClellan had gone to uh, Richmond to attempt to take over there and, uh, and lost the Peninsula cam campaign with enormous Union casualties. So you could say this was kind of the bottom of the Union when she came to Washington. And she saw the soldiers there. Uh, she and some friends crossed the river while her husband was doing things with the Sanitary Commission. He was a doctor and he had been uh, invited to join the fledgling Sanitary Commission, which is kind of a sort of like a Red Cross, but um, a, a little primitive, more, sure. more primitive than Red Cross. And she went across the river with these friends and they saw the troops marching. And in fact, they, it, as they were leaving to come back across the Potomac, uh, they surrounded her wagon that she was in with her friends and they started singing. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. And it was a really hearty marching song. And her one of her companions on this trip was her minister from Massachusetts. And he said, you know, Harriet, I mean, uh, Julia, that's a wonderful, wonderful song, but it's really kind of denigrating to John Brown. Couldn't you write something better? You're a poet. Couldn't you do something better than that? So she went back to the um, Willard Hotel and woke up in the middle of the night and started writing things on sanitary commission paper that her husband had left behind. Wrote it all down. The next morning when she got up, she made a few changes, um, but basically she had written the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She sent it to, Harp uh, to um, Harper's Weekly and they printed it in the next year, 1862, and it caught on like wildfire. And it was sung not only by the soldiers, but also by civilians. You know, with words like, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. The trumpet that never calls retreat. It was a very rousing song um, in the 1860s. And it's still rousing today, I think, when we hear it. The next one I want to talk about is in the book is uh, Clara Barton. And we think of her primarily because what we were taught as kids, she was a nurse. Yes, she did some nursing, but I think her real genius was to be a medical supply logistics expert. Now that doesn't have the ring to it that nursing does, but she was able to get medical supplies out to where they were needed, including in the field where the battles were being fought eventually, um, just through her own perceptive and constant badgering the logistics folks in Washington, DC. She made friends with a guy who was the, um, um, quartermaster of Washington, D.C., Rucker, 
And um, she said to him, when he came in one time and said, I've got three, I got three warehouses here in Washington filled with stuff to take to the field, a lot of medical supplies, which the medical corps at that point was really struggling to keep up with the number and the severity of the, uh, of the uh, wounds on the field. Well, you know, he, Rucker was not really ready to hear this woman who seemed a bit maybe hysterical and he put her off and she said, no, I want you to come out. I want to show you where my warehouses are. And finally she convinced him and he gave her uh, a wagon and he gave her a teamster and he also gave her a pass that she could use to get through, through lines um, and she used them and went back to him numerous times. He became her transportation mechanism just by sure sheer stick to and kind of making a pain in the butt of herself, but she got him to come on board. She also made great contact. She made a contact with Henry Wilson, who was the senator from Massachusetts. So she wasn't afraid to say to somebody, mm, gosh, you know, I think uh, Senator Wilson would not want to hear that you don't want to cooperate with me on these things. So she was a bit uh, uh, pushy in that sense. Sure. Um, and then the last woman who's probably the least well-known is Sarah Josepha Hale. She was a woman who was very famous in the mid 1800s. She ran a, a magazine, ran two magazines. The first one uh, called the uh, Ladies Book and the second one was Godey's Ladies Book, national circulation, quite large circulation. She had it in her head that there needed to be a day of Thanksgiving celebrated in the United States or commemorated. Uh, she felt it was as equally as important as the 4th of July, to give thanks for what the country had. And she approached four presidents, four of them never responded, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, and Buchanan, never even had the courtesy of writing her back. Finally, she wrote a letter in 1863 to Lincoln suggesting that there be a national day of Thanksgiving as a, as a form of beginning reconciliation between the two sides, between North and South. And she was smart enough to copy uh, William Seward, who was a friend of hers, uh, which she knew had he had uh, Lincoln's ear. Well, in less than a week, uh, Lincoln proclaimed the last Thursday in November as Thanksgiving Day, uh, which was a great relief to her and, uh, and a satisfactory conclusion to many long years of pushing for a Thanksgiving Day, but perhaps made even more urgent uh, by the American Civil War. Well, I've rambled on, Len. Do you have some questions that you want to? Well, yeah, you. you but <laughs> but uh, you you moved along, and and uh, it's a great introduction to what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and and I agree with you. The the, the issue with uh, Josepha uh, Hale is is a fascination to me. And uh, when I think of all the different uh, forms of publications and so forth. In your work and in, in looking at Hale, uh, it, strike, it struck me that there were two specific areas, and, and you you touched on both. I'm going to like to uh, to uh, focus back a little bit more on on this issue with her publications and so forth. Of course, women had very uh, limited opportunities available to them uh, in uh, early America, antebellum America, colonial America, and um, uh, education was not something that um, uh, was, was highly uh, sought after, more uh, home skills were, were considered to, uh, to be more important. And even today, uh, at least until the last 10 years or so, there were so many women's magazines and so forth that came out. Um, I realize that this is a little stretch, but you spent some time with this. And so I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on this is, is what do you think women's magazines did for women in the 19th century? Why, why were they important? And why is Hale such a leader in that? That's a great, a great question. I think it was pretty subtle. Um, these magazines, for the most part, featured fashion. The, the term fashion plate comes from these magazines. They had plates of women's clothing. Um, but she also slipped in messages about women's education um, also slipped in her message about needing a Thanksgiving day. Also was trying to pull women not to away from being just focused on what was referred to then as hearth and home. You know, women were there for the hearth and the home. 
she acknowledged that, but also tried to move them in some new directions. She thought women should have opportunities for professions that they hadn't had before. Uh, doctors was one of them. Uh, editors of magazines and writers were, were others that she thought. So she was a bit of a, um, I guess, a kind of a crypto uh, uh, person who was out there trying to convince women that they needed to take different roles, more important roles, and they needed to be educated too. Uh, the interesting thing about her is that when she was a small girl, she grew up in New Hampshire, and her brother went to Dartmouth College. Well, Sarah Josepha said, she was Sarah Josepha Buell then, said, well, I, I'd like to go to college. Well, you, you can't go. Uh, and she kept haranguing her brother. And finally, what he did is he would come home on, on uh, breaks from Dartmouth College, and he would sit down with her with his books, and he would tutor her. And she once said, uh, you know, I got the best Dartmouth education one could get without setting foot in a classroom. Um, so it was, a, it was very important to her that women be, be educated. And she she was a proponent of that. She used her magazines as a, what we call today a bully pulpit to get some of her messages out there. Did you did you see in any of your uh, did you see in any of your uh, research and so forth? Was it did she get any blowback from from uh, this advocacy? Uh, I mean, we're talking before the Civil War, and we're talking in the period right after the Civil War. And there's you know there's so many areas, uh, women's relief societies and all this other sort of stuff that it, it strikes me in trying to meld all this together that uh, the challenges for you were not so much telling the story of these five women, but rather it was to know which, um, which loose end to tie up and, and tie into the narrative and move on. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll leave Hale with this question. Uh, uh, did did you see any evidence of, of blowback uh, uh, for this uh, activism that, that Hale showed? No, because she was pretty subtle about it. I think she was able to con convince her editor, Louis Godey, who was the financial backing for the magazine. She was able to convince him that this was something that needed to be done. She was also very sly. She wrote articles uh, that were aimed at men to read the magazine. And it was, it was kind of, you know, men be sure your women read this magazine because they will become better homemakers, hearth and home people as a result of reading this. <laughs> she was working both sides of the street here. Uh, and there's evidence of her, you know, deliberately wanting uh, men, because they were going to wind up probably paying for the subscription, uh, right. men to be on board. Say, well, this is worthwhile. My wife will really get something out of this. But she got no, no blowback from those things. Where she did tread very lightly, and I don't find any evidence of true blowback, this was a national magazine. When the Civil War started, she had Southern readers and Northern readers. She never, ever put anything in it about the war, completely ignored the fact that the war was going on. Uh, you know, there were no pieces on what happened in Fredericksburg or what was happening in Vicksburg, nothing. Uh, it was all hearth and home. So, and that was really some pressure from her, uh, the publisher, Louis Godey. He, he really didn't want to get into politics. Uh, they did lose Southern, uh, they lost a number of Southern subscribers, but they did build the Northern subscribers base. But they, they were very clear that they weren't there to replace Atlantic Monthly and Harper's Weekly and uh, Leslie's Magazine. Those were, that, that's what they were there for, for pol politics. They were there to um, do the hearth and home thing, but also with a few notes on educating women and getting women to do things that uh, perhaps they hadn't thought that they could do as professions. You know, it's fascinating because um, uh, you, you hit the nail right on the head with this. I think um, uh, the, the, the lack of education has always been the limiting factor within a society is, is if you, if you don't have a common education uh, you don't you don't go anywhere and and I think this was pretty obvious and clear to me when I looked at the uh, the manner in which you treated Harriet Tubman and you talked about uh, her her accomplishments her core bravery in going back once having taken care of herself to go back and to bring others out but um, I want to approach two things with with uh, Tubman uh, at this time the first is um, I'd be more. I'd be grateful if you would um, 
maybe uh, tell us a little more about her Civil War activism, perhaps that people aren't fully aware of. How did how did she participate as a um, as a functional member of the uh, of the Union Army? Uh, not not an actual member, but as a as a functional member in tasks that she did in in the South during the war. Yeah, so two two things. Yeah, after the antebellum period, she still stayed active uh, in working with enslaved people who had escaped. But what she turned her attention to was um, the Union Army in the South, and particularly the Union Army as it was looking at invading South Carolina. She did some. Um, I guess you could call it spy work, that, that word has been used. She was a spy in a sense that she was able to move up the Combee River, which is a river that runs into, uh, uh, into the ocean. From South Carolina, yeah. yeah. South Carolina. She was able to move through there, you know, by pretending she was an enslaved person and, uh, you know, carrying stuff along and then kind of keeping an eye on things. Taken in uh, African-American soldiers, Union soldiers. Um, they enlisted them and they had built a fighting force. And she accompanied them up the Cahambi River uh, in three boats. And they went up there, they uh, did a couple of things. One, they destroyed some Confederate stores, other stores they took with them. They freed about 700 enslaved people and came back down the river, uh, not suffering one single casualty, which is kind of amazing that this took place. Uh, there are reports that she was armed during that whole process. Uh, she may have been, but never fired a shot in anger that I could find anywhere. The other thing she did after that was she went to uh, the battlefield at Fort Wagner, where the uh, Union troops had stormed Fort Wagner, and she cared for the wounded there. She was a nurse. She was a washerwoman. She did whatever you need. You know, basically, tell me what I need to do to help these soldiers. Um, Interestingly enough, at the same time, Clara Barton was there uh, in Fort Wagner, but uh, as far as I can find, their paths never never crossed. So she played an active role, particularly in South Carolina, um, in the mid to later part of the war. Okay, um, going a little further with uh, with Tubman, she slips out of public sight after the war. Sadly enough, you know the. Uh, the slaves are freed, the war ends, the country looks to reunite and so forth. And whereas most of, um, in, indeed, all of your other um, um, subjects all seem to move on and progress on, uh, uh, Tubman does not. And uh, Well, in a way she does. Um, after the war is over, she went to live in uh, Auburn, New York which is near, okay. New York, it's in central New York, uh, largely because of the beneficence of uh, William Seward. William Seward helped buy her house. While she right. was there, she started uh, an old, what we would call an old folks home or a home for elderly people, um, for especially for African-American uh, impoverished Blacks. And, th and that building still stands today. So she did that. Uh, the other thing she did, um, she was illiterate, so she couldn't write books like the other four. What she did was she would go on the speaking tour trail and spoke to a number of groups about um, rights, civil rights, uh, suffrage, uh, mm -hmm. and other uh, causes that she felt near and dear to her heart, um, and uh, did that very effectively. I believe at one point she even was taken carry, taken to the stage by her arm by uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton or uh, yeah, Elizabeth Cady Stanton took her up and introduced her and, and she gave a rousing speech because she, she was known, but her, her visibility sort of went down a little bit, um, but she was doing great things in her community, which she felt very strongly about in Auburn, New York. Uh, interestingly enough, there is a Liberty ship named after Harriet Tubman that sailed in uh, World War II. So she wasn't completely forgotten during those sort of dry years when we didn't hear much about her. But but I did note in, in um, your book, you, you spoke about um, how she was generally, generally impoverished that because of her uh, lack of education, that perhaps she wasn't as large a figure 
in the post-war period as uh, Frederick Douglass and so forth had been beforehand. No. Um, uh, and you attribute, I think, some of that to her lack of education. Some of that it, also, that's right. Uh, she couldn't write. Uh, so, you know, people got famous by writing books like Frederick Douglass did. Uh, and she didn't pick up on the speaking tour trail as soon as, as others had. So that did, that did hinder her. Um, and she was largely impoverished. Uh, ha had it not been for William Seward, she would have been in really dire straits. He would give her money. Uh, and people have asked me, you know, well, what are the flaws of these women? Well, you know, one of Harriet Tubman's flaws was she was not a good money manager. Uh, uh -huh. She would just spend the money on what she thought was an, an appropriate way of, uh, you know, using that money. But then she was broke. So she'd have to go back to people like Seward and say, you know, I've got this other idea, but I need some money. Um, so, yeah. You know, you, um, uh, you, you mentioned that, um, when she was on down around uh, Morris Island and in, um, in South Carolina, that she was there at the same time that Clara Barton uh, was there. And, uh, you know, Barton is, I think Barton is one of those great, great names in American history that everybody knows, but nobody I think really fully understands the totality of, of her accomplishments and, and why she was successful. Uh, you, you noted earlier in your in your overview of her that she uh, knew how to um, to reach out and touch the right people at the right time to make sure that they understood that uh, their cooperation would be would be highly appreciated in all the right levels. But when you get right back down to uh, to Clara Barton, you have a single woman who uh, mm -hmm. stood in a society in which. Uh, um, maternity and uh, being, a, being a man's husband was in many instances the highest thing that she could aspire to or that a woman could aspire to. And yet uh, she went independent, she went rogue. Uh, two questions related to her. The first is, was she so focused on career, in your opinion, was she so focused on career that she just didn't make a good candidate for a 19th century man to marry. In other words, that she was she was so focused on on involvement in in life that she wasn't necessarily interested in being a housewife and raising kids. Instead, she wanted and aspired for more than herself. Do you do you think that that's but that's what, right? Why do you think she didn't marry. The short answer to that is yes, she was very much involved in what she thought of as her career. Now she did have, uh, and I mentioned this in the book, she did have a boyfriend uh, named Colonel Elwell uh, in, uh, in South Carolina, I believe it was, during part of the war. So she was interested in men, but she was dogged about doing things and so persistent that anything that got in her way basically got run over. Um, she was not particularly kind to people who said no to her. Uh, she would only accept yes as an answer. Uh, so I think a man had a, had, would have his hands full with this woman who had such a strong um, sense of what she wanted to accomplish. Um, she, and she was burned. She, uh, when she, she started out teaching in Massachusetts and then for, for whatever reason, she decided to go to New Jersey and teach in Bordentown. She ran a school there, which was having problems with its male students. They were not doing well academically. She turned it around. She got them so that they were successful. They felt good about it. Uh, the, and female students also just loved Miss Barton. Uh, and then what did the school board do? Well, we need to expand this. It's working so well. Let's go bring in a man to be the principal. Well, that did it for Clara Barton. She said, you know, I, I will not stay here. I will not be paid less than a man would be paid for doing the same work. And so she left and went to Washington. So she was she was burned there rather badly. <laughs> Incidentally, the guy who they brought in was gone and within two months, I think, of his time there. He would say it was a disaster. She went to Washington and she worked in the patent office. She had some contacts through her Massachusetts uh, legislature friends. And she worked in the, um, the patent office, which was all male. And they would give her a hard time, you know. Uh, she always had to, you know, just do just the right amount of work, not too much, because they would get 
worried that she was going to take over the department or something. So she had a constant battle there. So she didn't have a happy existence with some male uh, colleagues, uh, both in the teaching profession and, uh, and at the patent office. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you think about this and you look at the woman and you look at what she accomplished, you know, we're going to address the, the, the Red Cross in just a second, but not for the reasons I think many people would normally anticipate. It strikes me, you know, at the time that she went into medicine, she went to the fields to assist with the support of the soldiers who were uh, uh, suffering so grievously, uh, both from, a, from a, an issue of the United States never having had an experience with that level of, of medical necessity and critical care, not just, not just sore throats and stuff, but rather the, the catastrophic industry, injuries of battle. Um, she never shied from any of that. She obviously had a very, very strong stomach. Uh, but uh, whereas Jonathan Letterman oftentimes gets all the recognition, uh, clearly it shows that, that um, Barton, had she been a man, probably would have been uh, spoken of in, in, in great and glaring uh, fashion, whereas where Barton's real fame comes from and where I'd like to, to finish with her is ask you about the Red Cross is that, you know, we have one perception of what the Red Cross is today, and you also address not only her involvement in, in founding the Red Cross, but also uh, her departure from the Red Cross and why she left. And I think uh, that that's fascinating. So I think what I'd like to see is, um, um, uh, can you address the European factors that drove her and inspired her to bring something like this to America and then briefly talk about her successes there and why she ultimately left? Yeah, uh, she went to Europe because she needed a rest. She would work, work herself into exhaustion. And while she was there, she fell into uh, some conversations with people who were involved in the Red Cross. And you had to have approved the Geneva Convention in order to have a Red Cross. She saw it and, and everything she had done up to that point prepped her for what was going to come next. She had been a disaster relief expert on the Civil War battlefield. She said, you know, my place is just behind the cannon. She wanted to be right there to handle the injuries when they, when the wounds, when they happened, uh, which sort of prepared her for disaster relief. Uh, so she came back all fired up that she wanted to do something about establishing a, an American Red Cross. Well, you had to have the passage of uh, the, um, the the act that uh, I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but um, I just mentioned it. Uh, anyway, you had to. It'll come uh, back to you. It'll come back to you. It, you had to. You had to approve this act in order to uh, have qualify have a Red Cross. Um, so she worked with Congress. She went back and and recontacted some of her senator friends. And in 1882, uh, they passed the law that made, that accepted the Geneva Convention. That's what I was looking for. The Geneva Convention was accepted by the U.S. Senate, passed and signed by the president. Then they could start a Red Cross. So then in 1882, that's what she did. She started the mechanics, having gotten that clearance taken care of, started the mechanics of creating a, an American Red Cross. And she was fabulous at it. So fabulous that she didn't want to let go of anything. And she was like, I, I draw the analogy with today's entrepreneurs, uh, particularly those who start up companies, and they take it to great heights. But then they say, well, you know, John or Mary, uh, time to let somebody else run it for a while. And you kind of sit back and, you know, relax a little bit and let somebody else take over the reins. And besides, you're drawn in so many different ways, you can't possibly focus on them all. Well, that was what happened to Clara Barton. Um, she was always dropping everything administratively and running out to the disaster area, which was great because she was very good at solving the problems, uh, the logistic problems. But things back at the, you know, the office uh, fell apart. And there were a couple of people, including a woman who uh, 
just was incensed at this, uh, put enough pressure on it that eventually, at a very older age, uh, they forced Clara Barton out, out of uh, the American Red Cross, which in a way is sad, but it gave her a little chance to sort of catch her breath and do some things. Because as I said, she had this habit of working to physical and mental exhaustion. And being an older woman at this point, you know, the exhaustion came quicker, but she had a little chance and she wound up doing some things. She got involved in the area of first aid after she left the Red Cross, which was essential. Uh, Red Cross didn't do first aid. So she worked up uh, a sort of protocol for handling first aid. Um, but yeah, she was, she had the entrepreneurial problem of uh, once you started the company, nobody's going to tear my hands off from this. Uh, <laughs> and it caused a few problems. John Sinclair um, is listening in, and uh, he he wanted to know um, uh, of the of the several biographies of uh, Clara Barton. Uh, which do you think is the if you had to read one, which would you read? Oh gosh, it's it's um, by the woman prior. I have my Elizabeth uh, Browning Pryor. Exactly, yeah. she passed away not too long ago. That's right. It's it's a toss up between that one and Oates, but I I would give prior if you had to read just one. Her book is the the best, the best, because I think it yeah, gets I, inside I, to the extent that she can. She's gotten inside Clara Barton's head and does a magnificent job of describing her and her her thought processes. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I I haven't read uh, Pryor's book on. Um, on on Barton, but I did read her book on uh, Lee reading the man mm. and and uh, Elizabeth, who who you know the interesting story of her was she was um, she worked for the State Department and she was one of the um, the uh, negotiators for the United States for the Dayton Accords uh, mm -hmm. in Ohio a number of years ago, and she was killed in an automobile accident uh, yes. not too terribly long ago. She was she was in our organization uh, when when she passed, and uh, I agree she's a remarkable. Uh, um, historian or was a remarkable historian and and, and I, would, I would think yeah I would I would think that her her style is is good so I I hope that's uh, uh, an answer to John's question um, uh, I want to go um, uh, to back before the war again and I want to talk a little bit about Harriet Beecher Stowe um, and I'll, I'll I'll reveal a little something of mine um, uh, relative to Stowe um, I was uh, going through a through a, uh, a rummage sale uh, a number of years ago, and I came up on a a ragged ragged uh, book that had lost its covers and everything, but its spine was still there. And uh, I picked it up and I looked at it, and it was in a, in a plastic bag, and it was a a key to Uncle Tom's cabin, mm -hmm. which I I have. It's about uh, three or four feet from me right now, and. I'm getting ready to get it rebound, but uh, there you go. Um, <laughs> to talk about talk about a perfect prop, but um, I, I'm I'm interested in this, and I and I and I want this for the audience as well. Uncle Tom's Cabin was was an extraordinary work of literature that showed the 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 art of of great writing and how it can move spirits, mm -hmm. how it can affect people and move spirits. And yet, because the book had such a incendiary message, something that, that really promised the, the ability to combust the country uh, in, in the message it was sending, uh, it, it had a great deal of social responsibility, even though it was a quote, work of fiction. And so, mm -hmm. I think when this first came out, uh, when Uncle Tom's Cabin first came out, I think she quickly realized that she was going to have to stand behind the, uh, the, 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 the call of fire that she had done. And I think that, that this book is that. Um, you have it, so I take it that you've been through it and stuff. I won't embarrass you by suggesting you know it <laughs> cover to cover, but... But tell me about how you how you feel about the key relative to the novel and how do they go hand in glove? Well, I think the, the genius to me that she wrote this book, The Key, is the fact that she got bombarded. I think it was the New York Observer was the pro-slavery newspaper in New York City. They just bombarded her with it. rather than take 
each separate complaint about what she had written and try to address them individually. She said, I'm going to sit down and write a response to everything. So once she had kind of caught her breath and gotten these responses, she crafted a book that's almost like a lawyer's brief. It takes all of those arguments against it and shows why they are true, citing case and example. I mean, it's here's a woman who wrote one of the most famous um, fictional accounts could turn around and write this thing that's like a lawyer's brief. I mean, you read it, it you start to fall asleep after about 10 pages because it is pretty dense. Is it really dense? Yeah. Uh, but it is a beautiful way of expressing what she felt and the facts that she had to back it up. Um, you know, it was like calling a, a expert witness. Here it is. Here's what I said. Here's the proof point. Here's what I said. Here's the proof point. Uh, it, it, it is quite an amazing piece. And I stumbled across it just by accident. Even before I started the book, I visited um, what has been called Uncle Tom's Cabin in Montgomery County, Maryland. It's not Uncle Tom's Cabin. Sure. Josiah Henson lived in it and he wrote a book about slavery. Uh, but they, they were selling this uh, reproduction copy and I was intrigued. So I bought it. And uh, then once I started doing the research on the book, The Better Angels, I read uh, all of it, uh, not in one sitting. <laughs> like, not sure. In one sitting. sure. Uh, so it, 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 it is a very important piece of work when you compare it to the literary work, which is also hands down. I mean, it was given literary merits uh, back in the 1850s, uh, mid 1850s by people like uh, Hawthorne and Walt Whitman, and um, uh, Hawthorne primarily and Edgar Allan Poe and others who wrote it said it was a, it was a coup de main in American literature. The other thing I, I bring up when I give this talk is we hear some really bad things about Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom's cabin. Um, the fact is, and there's a, a Columbia University professor who has studied Uncle Tom's cabin, all of those references to the sort of subservient, obsequious Uncle Tom did not come from Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book. There were things called Tom shows that sprung up usually probably in the late 1800s. These were minstrel shows and they took the theme of Uncle Tom's Cabin as a kind of, you know, organizing way, but they were generally white guys uh, with blackface and singing songs. And so Uncle Tom was his obsequious guy. Never, ever in Uncle Tom's cabin is Uncle Tom obsequious. Now you would have to say, well, wh why in the world did she not, you know, get her lawyer involved? And, and so the, the patents in those days and the literary licenses were so, you know, flimsy that it was very hard to prove anything. Of course, the, one of the most famous cases is, is um, The King and I, where they do uh, topsy. Sure. Uh, but those were those were strictly uh, stage shows done by what are referred to as the Toms um, post-Civil War. And, and if you read the book, as I've, I've done three times now in preparation for writing my book, uh, you don't find any obsequious uh, Uncle Toms in there. You know, um, each of these people, uh, the, 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 great, the brilliance of your book and the manner in which you tied all this together, um, I'm a real critical reader. I, I, I don't waste time reading stuff. If I, can't, if I can't find myself going from A to B quickly, I generally will abandon the book because I just don't have time to, to read it if, if the author hadn't done a good job. And, and uh you you would drive people down a corner and you'd let them take and, and peek over the over the fence a little bit and then you'd bring them out and then you'd take and you'd show them something else and and you always just gave us enough time to focus on what you were talking about whether it'd been a war or an, or a post war period or an, a pre war period event that you'd wet the appetite and then you'd move on you'd hit and you'd move on and mm -hmm. and I I found that to be very very effective and. It left me, you know, thinking more things. I, I found myself actively reading. I found myself thinking a lot underneath the umbrella uh, when I'd read what you were saying. Then the, the the sub rosa elements that you didn't write in the book, but could have written in the book and, and made another two hundred pages or so, uh, were were there worthy to be asked. And so, uh, in the fifth of the of the um, women that we're talking about tonight. Uh, 
and looking at Julia uh, Ward Howe, I appreciate the way you treated her across the board uh, and the omnipotence, the, the just the incredible power of all of these powerful women's contributions. The Battle Hymn of the Republic is singularly the most moving series of verses I have ever heard or read in my life. I mean, I just, there is no time that I hear that when I hear a chorus doing it mm -hmm. or in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. Uh, when you hear that, it, it reaches you viscerally. And so what I wanted to ask you about is because of this massive overarching legacy of the battle uh, hymn of the Republic, there's so much of Julia Award Howe underneath the umbrella that isn't appreciated because of this one achievement. What can you tell us that we really ought to know about Julia Ward Howe that we didn't get because of the magnificence of her achievement? Yeah, well, she was an, an accomplished poet before she wrote this. So she had kind of prep work, like, like I said about uh, Clara Barton. She had some prep work why she got where she did. She did, didn't sit down one time and decide, hmm, I think I'll write this poem, which became an anthem. She had done a lot of poetry and was pretty well known in, in poetry circles. Um, but this was a monumental kind of thing. And when the war was over, she was a very strong believer, as you might expect, in abolition. But after she segued very quickly into suffrage, uh, women's rights, pacifism, she had a number of different, uh, you know, animal cruelty. She had a number of different things that she was really interested in. And she would use, quite frankly, she would use her fame as the composer, uh, writer of the Battle of the Republic to have an audience. And people would come and listen to her. And every time she gave one of these lectures in a big hall, at the end, they would always say, sing the hymn, sing the hymn. So this, even into her later years, in her 80s, she'd get up from her chair where she'd deliver her remarks with a cane, walk up to the front and sing the battle hymn of the Republic, a cappella. And, you know, uh, one very hardened reporter from a Boston paper said there wasn't a dry eye in the house. It just was, uh, you know, a very moving experience to see the woman who wrote it sing it. Um, so she she finished out her career in her 90s, um, but she gave uh, lectures right up to the point that she was, I think, starting in her 90s, maybe even into her 90s. She had uh, she, she gave talks uh, and was a very compelling speaker. But the draw was she wrote the battle hymn. So uh, sure. Uh, well, you know, um, uh, you know, this is something it's, it's like I've said so many times before. And I, I think the advantage of these interviews are that you get a chance to address things of substance. But yet um, I liken it. To, I'm a person that reads about 30 pages an hour. And um, uh, and and I take a lot in in that period of time. We've had an hour to talk. I, I would just say this to our audience. Um, uh, you wrote 219 splendid pages, and we've only had a chance maybe to, to deal with um, 30 of them or so. And there's so much more in there that I hope that people will find it inspirational, will want to acquire your book and uh, read more about it, because I think uh, they will find themselves as critically challenged uh, as I was, and that that I always find is the, the greatest reward for a good book. Having said that, I can't let um, the time pass tonight without uh, asking you, and I have to admit, I was confused for initially when you sent me the couple of books when I asked you for copies of them last year, and you sent them to me. I looked quickly, and um, uh, I, I, I scanned them, and I said, okay, maybe, and you know, it, they weren't going to be top of my list to read because I had a lot of other things to read. And, um, uh, but I thumbed through a few of them and stuff. And I misread the initial book you did um, uh, on McClellan. I thought we were talking about George B. McClellan, the general of the army. And, and 
lo and behold, kicked me in the rear end after I looked at that. And I said, well, I better get ready for this thing. Let me look at this closer. I found out, no, it's not George B. McClellan. It's uh, it's some soldier, George McClellan. So I'd like to ask you, uh, well, take a few minutes and tell us about your first book and, uh, and uh, what really excited you about it. Well, that's, that's how I got started in all this. <clears throat> I retired from uh, two corporate jobs, uh, GE and Fannie Mae. And people would ask me, you know, they always say, well, what are you going to do now that you're retired? So I would say, well, I'm going to write a book. Uh, coincidentally, uh, my wife's uncle had been a Civil War Roundtable president in New York City for a number of years, bought some letters, 42 letters, back in the 1960s. He died, and I got the letters, and there, there they were. They sat in my den for a long period of time. Finally, when I was retired, I got them out and started to transcribe them. They were the letters of a soldier in the 155th Pennsylvania reporting his experiences from September 1862 to when he was wounded in 1865 at the Battle of Five Forks. And one letter in that group was from his sister who finds him in a field hospital uh, in Petersburg. I, I must tell you, I, I read those letters and I said, this is, this is a story that needs to be told, but I'm not just going to take them and put them in a book so you can read the letters. I want to build some context around them. So I did a lot of research to build context. So when you read George's letters and the 41 letters, you have a sense of what was going on, uh, the, sort of the, the big picture. And I tried to make it you know, compatible enough that you read the big picture and then you could get into his letters and understand exactly what he was talking about. And he was in every, they did not fight at Antietam. They came the day after it was over. But his unit fought in every single battle that the Army of the Potomac fought in all the way through the end of the war. So he had some really good experiences to recount. He was wounded at uh, uh, the North River, North Anna River, um, sat out the battle, the next battle in the uh, Overland campaign, but then he was back at Petersburg. So, and then he was really gravely wounded and presumed dead on the battlefield, but then brought in by his men and, uh, and uh, survived and lived until 1898. Uh, but it, yeah, that, that got me interested in the Civil War and really fired up the jets in terms of research and understanding what's out there and um, all the different resources that are, that are out there. They're, they're just incredible when you tap into them. Um, sure. You know, um, uh, I, a couple of uh, quick comments uh, as we wrap up. Um, um, uh, Bob Carlson uh, uh, noted, he said, I was thrilled to view up close the original handwritten copy of the Battle Hymn of the Republic at an exposition in Boston Public Library about 10 plus years ago. And he just, he just asked a curiosity, you know where that copy of the um, Battle Hymn exists permanently? I don't know that. Um... I have not seen the original. What I've seen is the uh, one that was used for the uh, Harper's Weekly, um, which is when it first appeared um, in 1862. 18, uh, 1862. Yeah, the cover, it was the cover of, uh, of that magazine, uh, but I, I've never seen the original. Great. And uh, one one other comment uh, as, as we wrap up uh, one of our, uh, attendees tonight, Corky Lowe, uh, sent a message that I'd like to share with you. He, he very much appreciated the, um, the presentation, ID. He, he was so inspired that while uh, you were talking, he went and bought copies of your book for his granddaughters who were growing up and knowing Corky as I do and knowing how important history is to him. Um, I think uh, he wants his granddaughters to have a full appreciation of of what strong women throughout history have done. And I, and, and Bob, I, in, in concluding this, I'd just like to say uh, that you, you have indeed uh, presented us with another of the dimensions of, uh, of American history in the Civil War and have, have reminded us just how many different components go into making a great country and a great um, um, uh, legacy. And when you read about how people respond in times of adversity and so forth and how they rise above both their stations and the challenges that they face, you can only be inspired by what tomorrow is likely to hold for you. So for that, I'd like to thank you and um, 
Well, thank uh, thank you. Yeah. I, I appreciate what you said. I, I would hope that that young people pick up the book and read it or that parents and grandparents would buy it for children who want to know about American history. And if it does nothing else but send people out to learn more about these five women, then I've done my job. My one commercial piece here is that, yes, it's available as a book. It's also available on Kindle and is also available as an audio book. Oh, wonderful. Uh, you know, so many people as an audio book, you can, you can just listen to that going down the road and uh, uh, that, that yeah. promises many, many great hours. So um, on behalf of this, um, uh, I'm seeing some notes. Um, uh, let me, let me finish on a couple of those notes from people. Um, uh, uh, Mary Caldwell has said, uh, I think this book is a great contribution to women's history and, uh, Lauren Schaud has said, truly inspirational. Thanks for this important slice of U.S. history. Herstory, excuse me. Okay, Lauren, I got it. <laughs> Herstory. So thank you so much, Bob, uh, for all you folks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to see this again, or if you think people ought to see this, keep an eye out. I'll send out the announcement for Dave Collins' talk next week on either Thursday and either Friday or Saturday. and the copy of this presentation will be attached so you can get other people who may have missed this tonight, give them a chance to watch it. So Bob, thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you in person and um, have a great one. And uh, we'll see you around the ranch. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, Bob. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.